Welcome. We're going to give just a few moments for all the attendees to come in, um, but we wanted to welcome you uh, to the uh, next panel in the Policy Studies Organization Conference. Um, this particular panel presentation is called the ISIS model and its influence over global terrorism. So we're going to turn it over to our speaker today, and we thank you so much for your attendance. Thanks, thanks, Rahima, uh, for, for the introduction. Uh, I'm, hi, I'm, I'm Mahmoud Singhis. I'm research faculty at Terrorism, Transaction, and Crime, and the Corruption Center at Charles School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. I have research and also field experiences on terrorism and terrorist financing and the transnational crime issues. I have some publications also about terrorism, especially ISIS and Al Qaeda. I think last week uh, I have published some op-eds about Afghanistan, Taliban, and ISIS-K. Today uh, I will be speaking about uh, ISIS model because we always know that terrorism has been always one of the uh, top security issues in the world. And in today's uh, my presentation, I will, I will speak about this ISIS model. I think I am the only panelist in this uh, session, so I will be enjoying using whole time just for my lecture and also if there are questions I can I can get after my my uh, lecture. My plan is to speak around 35 or 40 minutes, then I will let you ask your questions if you have, as I said. And uh, this is my agenda. And of course, uh, as I said, terrorism always has been one of the top security issues. Uh, I'm also currently teaching American security policy course at George Mason University. And before the pandemics and after the pandemics, I just did some surveys with my students just to learn and just to ask them to list uh, some of security issues, some security threats in the US and also in the world. Before the pandemics, uh, my class listed, I have around 50 students. My class listed terrorism as one of the top security issue. Actually, I was after the pandemics uh, in my uh, this semester's class, I was expecting to see some changes uh, in the list of my students of the security threats in the world. But I have seen that again, there is no change. Again, more than 90% of my class listed terrorism as one of the uh, most threatening issue in the world. Also uh, for terrorism, we all know that uh, it's always on top of the agenda. I think today we are speaking more about the capacity of another ISIS group, ISIS Khorasan in Afghanistan. Also we have discussed about Taliban and Taliban's tactics and the whether again, how terrorism works, maybe in the model of Taliban in Afghanistan. And also we are much concerned always about this lone actor terrorism, this homegrown extremists. And then very recently we have seen the active uh, right-wing extremist groups in US, Canada, and also in Europe. So there's always something else about terrorism uh, as uh, the security issues. And then uh, we all know that ISIS or Al Qaeda, they're always active groups. But today now uh, is fighting against not only ISIS core or Al Qaeda core, also these groups have created uh, some, some franchises in different parts of the world. Uh, also, uh, by the way, uh, I'm now working at a Global Terrorism Database Project of State Department. I'm academic director. In the last four years, I have a chance to go over and to observe very closely uh, various types of terrorist organizations in all over the world. And then these ISIS groups have always uh, received my attention because interestingly, maybe every day or every month, we have seen a new ISIS franchise, ISIS group, uh, declaring loyalty uh, to the ISIS core and then or pledging allegiance, then op operating very violently in the regions or countries uh, being under the banner of ISIS group. Also, if I, if I go again, come back to my, my presentation today, uh, this is my agenda. Very briefly, I will mention about uh, what this, these models are. So what I'm meaning in my paper uh, for ISIS model and terrorist organizations models. Then the secondly, very briefly about the history of ISIS, who ISIS is. And then I will continue with, because now we are having a question, especially after the killing of ISIS's leader, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdad in 2019 in Northern Syria, whether ISIS is really defeated or not. I will be showing you some graphs, some statistics, Again, just to get your attention on finding an answer for the, this question 
whether ISIS is really defeated or not. Then I will mention about my uh, ISIS model, uh, the elements of this model, the pillars. Actually, by the way, what I am meaning with this ISIS model, because in the world, today's world, uh, these right-wing extremist groups, other types of terrorist organizations, and especially the jihadist organizations are copying uh, some tactics, some targets or ideologies of uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda. So that's why it is the reason why I began to more think about on the context of specific ISIS model. Then I will uh, be showing you what elements are making up this ISIS model. Then uh, I will finish my uh, presentation with how does ISIS model influence uh, global terrorism. We know that these powerful and well-equipped terrorist organizations develop organizational, operational, and ideological uh, models. So for operational models, what I'm meaning, uh, the groups using or developing some specific targets. For example, in the history of terrorism, the anarchist groups, they were the first groups using assassination as a tactic, then which was later on copied by, by others. Then Tamil Tigers, for example, it's another example of using a specific tactic. Uh, Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, LTTE used, and the, the, this group uh, was the first one using suicide bombing as a terrorist uh, tactic, which was mimicked by later on uh, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the acronym of the PKK, and also the Black Widows in Russia. I think these Black Widows, they were the group of women who lost their family members, uh, detonated themselves just to take revenge from, uh, from Russian military. Then also these Black Widows, they were, they acted like, uh, detonated themselves like suicide bombers. Ideological models, of course, we know that terrorist organizations are their own ideologies. Uh, some of them are like religious groups are seeking for utopia in their small world, in their mindset, like religious groups, mostly using uh, religious teachings or religious uh, precepts, or some of them are a group of crazy people. This is my definition for right-wing extremist groups because the ideology for right-wing extremism is more based on the conspiracy theories. And then these groups are more against the liberal, group, liberal groups. And also they are always having their hate groups Sometimes they are putting LGBT in their hate groups, sometimes immigrants, uh, sometimes also <clears throat> uh, more racist groups. Also there are other uh, ideologies and then anarchism or left-wing left organizations, which these groups mostly used Maoist or Marxist teachings and they, in the 80s and 90s, then they created their own uh, ideologies. I think the third model uh, could be related to the terrorism it is uh, organizational model because terrorist organizations are having their own organizational structure. For example, uh, jihadist groups, they are mostly using this top-down hierarchical model, but recently we have seen some changes like using this hub-spoke model, which is which there is a central actor in this model. Then uh, other members first, for example, Moscow before communicating with others in, in this type of organizational structure. ISIS model is more applying to this HubSpoke model. And recently also we have seen uh, another organizational structure as a model uh, is all channel. Also this is <clears throat> Al-Qaeda more uh, using this uh, all channel uh, model. Uh, in this model, groups are loosely organized around the leader and with no central control and no functional differentiation. And the, the third model I think would be more applying to uh, market model to right-wing extremist groups because there is no distinct leadership or functional differentiation. I think in today's world, these right-wing extremist groups, they are more operating uh, leaderless and also more using decentralized models. Maybe I think it is the reason why we have seen for right-wing extremist groups attacks using more uh, lone actors. So we haven't seen like a jihadist group uh, when it comes to writing extremist groups. Again, it is more related to the group structure and also their uh, operations of these right-wing uh, extremist groups. I think uh, ISIS is having its own ideological, operational, and also organizational uh, model, which I will, be, I will be giving you some details in, in, in the following slides. ISIS, I think uh, the group is using 
different names. Sometimes we are very confused. I think in the beginning, we were very confused what the acronym uh, is meaning for ISIS. And the, the group, for example, mostly is using ISIS. It is Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And another acronym for ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and Levant. So because we know that this ISIS group, they are aspiring maybe in the first step to establish a state in the Levant region because it was, it was uh, the state for uh, the early Muslims uh, in the first 200 years of Islam, the Muslims, they were able to uh, establish their own state, especially in the Levant, uh, Levant region. So that's why the group historically also uh, began to use ISIL. And also, of course, there is another one, which is the Arabic version uh, Daesh. So it is the Arabic acronym of, again, ISIS, uh, ISIS names. Maybe here I can just tell you very briefly, because I told you I am the only panelist, so I can use my time. Uh, of course, I don't want to distract your attention. I think also it is here worth talking about the ISIS strategy why always trying to use the group, uh, I mean, Islamic State or putting somewhere else in its name, Islam? Because I think the group is giving more the same sense of representing the whole Islamic community uh, in the world. And today, ISIS is the world's uh, most popular terrorist organization in terms of uh, how it is in the media, in terms of its maybe operations, its brutal tactics, uh, always you can see some reports, some, some, some media news about ISIS. I believe which the organization is enjoying uh, seeing this kind of media news because they are all serving the popularity of uh, ISIS and the, this terrorist organization. Because this organization, uh, organization is well aware of how popularity works and how popularity is really uh, strategic for the expansion, for the development uh, of, of, the, of this organization. That's why uh, ISIS and uh, today some other groups are more media oriented. ISIS was founded uh, in 2004 after the invasion of Iraq. Then it was the offshoot group of Al Qaeda. Then the group first emerged uh, and used uh, the name of Al Qaeda in Iraq, AQI. Then the group faded in the obscurity in until 2007, began to reemerge in 2011. Then uh, the group began to invade a territory uh, in, in the region. ISIS's leader uh, announced its caliphate because, uh, as I told you, these groups are more aiming to give uh, the smell or the more the sense of Islam because the, the, these groups are showing themselves, as I said, like uh, they're representing Islam in, in, all, in all over the world. So the, you can see they are more using Islamic uh, terms or jargon or maybe more Islamic uh, teachings. And the caliphate, the caliph, because uh, I think after the collapse of Ottoman Empire, the Muslims in the world, they had their caliph then, their caliph was the Ottoman Empire until the uh, 20s. But then the Islamic world, they, they didn't have any caliphate, any caliph, like, like the leader country of representing whole Muslim community. Then these groups in their, again, as I said, small world in their mindset, they began to fight against and represent Islamic world and using more the wording of caliphate or, or the caliph. Then in 2014, uh, ISIS announced its, its uh, caliphate in Syria. I think also it was a time for ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda, they began to have, I, I think uh, some, some clashes. So they began to see each other as rivalries because Al Qaeda was also fighting against or to be the caliph of the Islamic world. I think after 2015, military campaigns led by United States brought about considerable losses uh, to ISIS in, in Syria. I think uh, also 95% of uh, ISIS territory, the group lost uh, in 2017 as a result of these military campaigns in, in Syria. And the US also shifted its campaign and uh, began to support back the Syrian Kurds under the flag of Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF. Then this uh, SDF groups, they were successful uh, in their fight against ISIS. Then they captured also uh, ISIS's territory 
in northern Syria. I think also in 2019, we heard about, uh, we heard that uh, some announcements, some statements that ISIS was uh, defeated in, uh, in Syria and when US forces uh, killed uh, Baghdadi. But uh, I believe that it may be too early to consider that ISIS is defeated because I will be showing you now some graphs and some statistics showing us the group's capacity in all over the world. I just copied here, uh, United States Statistical Inex Support State Department Report, 2019 uh, State Department Report, the page showing us here ISIS and its affiliated groups in all over the world. ISIS was able to uh, do attacks uh, in 2019, around 600 attacks. Also, you can see here ISIS-K, ISIS Khorasan. I think now it is one of the most uh, well-known popular franchises of ISIS uh, in Afghanistan. After the Taliban's takeover, the group was able to do some successful attacks uh, in the last two or three months, uh, targeting uh, internationals, also targeting civilians. Also the group was the perpetrator of two consecutive uh, mass attacks targeting the Shia community in, uh, in Afghanistan. In 2019, the group was the perpetrator of 47 incidents, but I believe in, 20, uh, in 2021, because according to one media source yesterday, I saw that ISIS-K did at least 50 attacks in just one, uh, one month after the Taliban's uh, takeover. I think this is another, to another topic to discuss about who can fight against uh, ISIS-K. I'm not saying here Taliban because we know Taliban's priorities, Taliban's capacity. But uh, based on or considering the group's current capacity and operations, I think uh, we will be more hearing about ISIS-K in the future. ISIS West Africa, I think is another active group uh, operating in, in, in Nigeria, also fighting for uh, the lead, regional leadership, fighting for, for, uh, for Boko Haram. And uh, the group also was, uh, did 85 attacks in Nigeria in 2019. You can see here, I don't wanna go each of them in a detailed way, ISIS Sinai province, ISIS Philippines and the Bank Samoro. Interestingly, also in my research, I have seen that there has been geographical division between ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda affiliated groups and the groups, especially in, in the Philippines, they are uh, without an except, exception, these five active Muslim groups, they all, pledged allegiance and declared loyalty to ISIS and one of them is Bank Samoro, Islamic Freedom Fighters, and another also one in this list, it's Maori group. So they all uh, pledged allegiance to ISIS. You can see here ISIS Philippines, I'm sure you should have heard, you must have heard about uh, Abu Sayyaf group. And there are two Abu Sayyaf groups, Abu Sayyaf in Sulia and Abu Sayyaf in Basili. I think uh, Abu Sayyaf in Basili group, they, declared loyalty, then they began to use the name of ISIS Philippines branch in, in the country. So the group also was very active in 2019 as well. And ISIS Central Africa, German, Kashmir, uh, ISIS Bangladesh, Mozambique, Yemen, Somalia, Tunisia, Libya, also are some other ISIS uh, franchises in all, in all over the world. Just to see the capacity of ISIS again in 2019, uh, this is top 10 known perpetrator groups with the most incidents. Taliban is the leading organization followed by ISIS and uh, around 600 attacks by, by ISIS. In this list also you can see another in the top 10 list, there's another ISIS franchise, which is ISIS West Africa. Uh, also it, it is listed as another active group in this top 10 organizations list. Top 10 perpetrator, perpetrators with the most casualties. I think when it comes to how deadly these groups are, this, this table is showing us the deadliest organizations in all, in all over the world. I think in here you can see four ISIS groups. So they were the most deadliest organizations uh, in the list of uh, casualties. Casualties in this uh, table is showing us people killed or, or wounded. In 2019, uh, the casualty count was around 3,000 uh, by ISIS, but by but uh, uh, ISIS West Africa, another 2,000, 
and the ISIS Philippines uh, around 500. And also uh, you can see here for ISIS-K, it was uh, more than 700. I think uh, in total, the casualties by ISIS-4 and its franchises are uh, several thousands, uh, were several thousands in 2019 in this, in this table. Another, I have another uh, graph for you just to show the group's capacity. I think a victim type analysis as, as are really critical for us to show us any group's capacity because we know that the powerful organizations are targeting especially the military and the state institutions. And also they are trying to give message to the civilian population that I'm just fighting against the government. Of course, they are aiming to get the support of a civilian, a civilian population when they are selectively targeting uh, the military and the state institutions. But also there is also one important clue for us about the capacity. Any group who is mostly targeting the government, military law enforcement or state institutions, I think it wouldn't be wrong to say that these groups have some level of capacity. In 2019, even though ISIS has lost its capacity, uh, we know that, for example, uh, most of ISIS members, uh, they left the country. But again, I think we shouldn't forget that even today, according to some international reports, there are 16,000 uh, ISIS militants in Iraq and Syria. I think there were around uh, 30,000. And uh, mostly in, in Iraq and Syria, these ISIS militants, they are operating more or using uh, sleeper, uh, sleeper cells. I think in Syria's Diazor or in Iraq, uh, Diyala, uh, you can see uh, some active uh, ISIS sleeper cells and the uh, operating and the targeting the military and then the law enforcement or state institutions. In 2019, uh, military and uh, the government, I think it is 36%. I think uh, this is showing us uh, some level of capacity uh, of ISIS uh, in, in Syria and in, in, uh, in Iraq. When we look at the proportion of attack types and the breakdown by top five perpetrators 2019, uh, in 2019, 22% of incidents recorded the use of IEDs, which is the acronym for improvised explosive devices. I think around 2000 incidents, the 22%. And in this list, the Taliban, uh, 51%, uh, which accounted for around 1000 uh, Taliban attacks used IEDs, and then around 300, the ISIS also is the second one uh, in this list. ISIS used in its 300 attacks IEDs. Assassination, 3%. You can see here, again, ISIS is following Taliban, and Taliban is the first organization using uh, mostly the assassination in the world. And suicide, uh, we have seen again the, the same list. Taliban, also ISIS, again here, the second in the list of uh, suicide uh, tactics used by these organizations. This is, this is uh, ISIS model, but I think before that, I think it wouldn't be wrong, that, uh, wrong to say that maybe there are some statements, there are some victor statements against ISIS, especially even in Syria and Iraq, that the group uh, is defeated. But when we look at, uh, international reports, some media news, some media sources. I think uh, last year in, in 2020, between January and May, uh, one also database recorded around 600 ISIS attacks in Iraq and in Syria as well. So I think the conclusion would be today, ISIS is really active and also it's spreading its ideology and also expanding it all over the world. So also we know that other groups, who are under the flag of ISIS are copying uh, these ISIS's models. That's why we have seen uh, in the list of uh, top 10 countries with the most casualties, we have seen four ISIS groups in this list. And uh, I think uh, we should talk about uh, why these groups are copying or how these groups are copying this ISIS's model. But before that, what is uh, made up this ISIS model. You can see here, for example, controlling territory and then the expanding Salafist ideology and creating provincial affiliates, inspiring one actors, claiming responsibility, using lethal attacks, 
and utilizing media, social media, and also generating revenue. I think, of course, we can add maybe some other elements here. I just thought about, for example, this morning, the leadership, because we know that uh, for ISIS core, for example, after the killing of Abu Bakr al Baghdad in 2019, it just took 12 hours for ISIS to replace its leader. So, for example, the Western world is using more decapitation, uh, the targeting of the leader, when it comes to the when it comes to fighting against jihadist groups. But there have been some debates how, how effective it is because after the killing of the leader in this top down top down hierarchical organizations after the killing of leader. It is just taking several hours to, to replace uh, these organizations and these organizations are being very resilient. So I think also I, I can adhere the leadership also uh, as another element of uh, ISIS model. But today I will be speaking more about uh, the first one, controlling uh, territory and the acting like a de facto state. In 2015, the, this map is showing us ISIS's map. I think the world was stunned, was shocked to see uh, ISIS's controlling territory in 2015, benefiting from Iraq's and Syria's uh, growing instable instability uh, in, the, in the region. Actually, no one was predicting to see such a brutal and uh, such a, a successful organization who was able to control uh, territory and also expand uh, its uh, influence and regions in uh, all over the world. I think also today uh, there are two requirements, as far as I know, for local jihadist groups operating in different parts of the world. So to be able to be under the flag of ISIS, they are required first to control the territory, and then the second to be a sizable organization, which is uh, to have several hundred uh, militants. And uh, for example, uh, one last example is uh, Allied Defense Forces in DRC, in Congo. This group was operating more, more locally, but then this group began to use the uh, name of ISIS, then it is known as ISIS DRC. But I think uh, how this group deserved to be under the flag of ISIS is because ADF was controlling some territory and also ADF had, uh, has some several militants. I think here also we are having uh, another big question why why we have seen these local jihadist groups are competing each other in Africa, in the Middle East or Asia to be under the flag of ISIS. I think uh, uh, strategically, I believe that if they are using, if they are, for example, deserve to be under, to be under the flag of ISIS, I think it is really serving uh, their popularity. Just let me give you one example in Mozambique, for example, uh, Ansar al-Sharia group in Mozambique, it was, it was locally operating and it was more fighting uh, economic grievances, grievances and more operating in naturally rich uh, <clears throat> regions in, in Northern Mozambique and mostly composed of the Muslim insurgents. I think no one has heard about Ansar al-Sharia and why the group is fighting for their ideology and their goals until the group begins to use the name of ISIS Mozambique's branch. I think also ISIS Mozambique also is now listed as a terrorist organization using US State Department uh, foreign terrorist organization list. So also now maybe we can talk about why these groups need popularity because we have seen in all over the world that the more the, these groups are popular, the more they can get funds or they can get more recruits. So that's why they're giving much importance to be in the media and also to gain publicity and also to be more popular organization. I think using the name of ISIS and being under the flag of ISIS is giving these local jihadist groups to be popular. So that's why they are more preferring to use this strategy and the trying to get or deserve, because I told you two requirements, controlling the territory and then having some several uh, hundred militants. Also today, we know that ISIS West Africa also is controlling the territory and also Al-Shabaab is, is another one. In Africa, I think also you can see wherever there are ISIS groups, you can assume that these groups are uh, controlling some, some territories. How about expansion of the Salafist ideology and the creation of provincial franchises? 
I don't want to speak about here the Salafism, but I think yeah, very briefly, uh, I can tell you that the world has witnessed these Islamist groups, I think starting from 1980s, most related to, to, uh, related to some consequences of the Shah revolution in Iran, also the, some consequences of the Soviet's occupation in Afghanistan. But uh, after 2000, after 9-11, again, we began to see more Islamist groups operating in all over the world. I think it wouldn't be wrong to, to tell here that more than 95% of these Islamist groups are using uh, Salafist uh, ideology. So, because we know that Salafism, it is a different version, version of Islam. It is the strict interpretation of Quran and the Hadith, and also they are more literalist. Just let me give you one example. For example, uh, for the beheadings, in one of my articles also, I try to explain how these groups are are interpreting Quran, for example, and then how they are justifying their brutal tactic, uh, these beheadings. I think in Quran it says <clears throat> you can you can uh, smite the neck. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, but uh, when we look at, for example, uh, this surah in Quran, uh, also it, it, it mentions about uh, some captives or releasing some captives. But this jihadist group, they are just using the first sentence of this, this surah, which says you can smite the neck, but also the surah says that you can smite the neck during the war. So according to some interpreters, if there are some wars, you can kill people because smiting neck means uh, killing the people. Also, in the continuation of this surah, also, there are some sentences saying that you can have some captives or you can release some captives. So also according to these interpreters, it means that you, you, you are not, maybe you mustn't kill everyone else in the war. Uh, if, the, for example, if they are captives, so maybe you don't need to kill the, these people. But these jihadist groups, they are just using the first sentence and just literally, they are just uh, using it and they are just uh, beheading people. And also, as I said, uh, in their small small world, they believe that they are at war against the, against the West. Also, uh, there are, for example, uh, in Quran, uh, it mentions about uh, uh, non-believers. So according to their interpretation, the non-believers are all Westerners because they are all infidels. But again, the, it is more uh, the strict interpretation of Quran and also that's why the Salafist ideology, uh, maybe for in terms of counterterrorism policies, uh, in my classes, I am more focusing on and telling my students what uh, Salafism is. Of course, we cannot generalize here or all uh, Salafism. Also, there are different versions, but I am more here meaning more uh, the, the militantly interpreted version of uh, Salafism. And uh, this 95, more than 95% of these Muslim groups, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, uh, Al ISIS, Al Qaeda franchises groups, and they are all again using this uh, Salafist ideology. And uh, uh, in this model, expansion of uh, Salafist uh, ideology and the, the provincial franchi franchises, you can see here ISIS Central Africa, ISIS West Africa. Uh, they are all, for example, uh, in Africa and ISIS Tunisia and ISIS Libya or Mozambique. I think all these groups have different stories, how they formed, how they emerged and how they began to use the name of uh, ISIS. I just want to get your attention to ISIS Sinai because Ansarul uh, Baptist group uh, formed and they be emerged in 2011. Then this group in its early years began to uh, pledge allegiance to Al Qaeda. But after the Oster of Morsi, after the coup uh, in, in Egypt, so we saw that ISIS, this Ansarul Baptist group, they changed their names and they began to use uh, uh, the name of ISIS Sinai uh, in in the country. Because it is the matter of popularity, it is the matter of getting more resources and more, more recruits. So that's why, why these groups are preferring to be, use uh, ISIS, ISIS names. ISIS Greater Sahara also is another interesting group in, in the Sahel. And uh, another Al Qaeda group, Al Murabitun, then some defectors of Al Murabitun left the organization. Then they formed ISIS Greater Sahara in, in Mali. And today also this group is another active group uh, operating in, in the Sahel. I think also, by the way, I can tell you that one more uh, commonality for the ISIS groups in Africa, 
they are strategically, they are selectively just targeting the Christians, Christian tribes, and also state institutions, and also uh, the military or international military. Because uh, they're, they're, they are using hearts and minds policy because they believe that in Africa to, to get more recruits, so they should be uh, to get more funds uh, in Africa, uh, they should show their organizations fighting against uh, the governments and also being the vanguards of the rights of these Muslim, Muslim tribes in, uh, in Africa. I think also there is here one policy implication. So wherever, for example, there are the sense of being oppress uh, oppression, I mean, for these Muslim people, Muslim tribes in Africa, for wherever they are fighting against, for example, other tribes, I think today, now it's a common trend to see how these uh, tribes are leaning towards this ISIS or Al Qaeda, because uh, they are getting maybe some weapons, some logistics. Of course, more importantly, uh, they are being popular. Also, they are having a chance to uh, show their goal to the uh, all over the world. I don't want to go again other ISIS franchises, but I, I talked about ISIS K and the ISIS Philippines. It is Abu Sayyaf group and the, uh, also. Uh, ISIS Mozambique, uh, I, oh, maybe by the way, ISIS Somalia, uh, I think one uh, Al-Shabaab commander who was tasked uh, as Al-Shabaab commander in Puntland region in Somalia, then the, the, this leader, he betrayed the organization, then formed his own organization. Now, today, I think there are three or 400, this ISIS Somalia group uh, active, especially in Puntland region of, uh, in, in Somalia. The comparison of ISIS and Al-Qaeda attacks in 2019, you can see here, ISIS and its affiliates are more active than Al-Qaeda because more casualties than, uh, and also more incidents than, uh, than Al-Qaeda. I think in, in total, you can see here, guys, uh, in total, there are more than 10,000 uh, ISIS uh, and Al-Qaeda casualties. I think last year it was, more than 14,000 just uh, for uh, by, by Taliban. So in the world, there are 80, uh, every year, terrorism databases are recording around 50,000 casualties. But I think uh, these 50,000 casualties, they are mostly by these jihadist groups, I think 60 or 70% by uh, the jihadist groups. Inspiring lone actors, I think uh, this is another uh, trend in terrorism area, starting from especially 2011, we began to see these homegrown extremists. They are European born or US, US born uh, individuals. So inspired by ISIS or Al Qaeda's ideologies, mostly they are inspired by, by the ISIS. Then these ind individuals, they operate according to their own timetable and they, they are untraceable because they are all uh, self radicalized individuals. But also, uh, I have my own data set for this lone actors and homegrown extremists between 2010 and 2020. I think uh, more than 20% of attacks uh, in this 10-year uh, period used uh, ISIS, uh, ISIS organizations ideology. So these individuals, they were more inspired by, by ISIS uh, in this 10-year period. Claiming responsibility is, is another element of ISIS model because ISIS, I think also it is the statement uh, by someone else from the group saying that the group is behind the organization. I think the group is aiming to get some credits when they are claiming responsibility, even though they know that they will be punished. I think in the world today, one out of seven, according to one media news, one out of seven incidents recorded uh, claiming responsibility. ISIS was one of the most reliable organization until 2015, uh, when the group was uh, powerful uh, in terms of claiming responsibility. But interestingly, uh, after ISIS began to lose some territory and its power in 2018, in 2019, ISIS began to jump also for any attacks committed by, by Muslims in all over the world and just to show that the group was uh, the perpetrator. I think also today, other groups learned ISIS to claim responsibility. I think mostly ISIS-K and ISIS West Africa 
branches their claiming responsibility. Also, Al Shabab is another one. I think today Al Shabab seems to be the most reliable one because ISIS lost its credibility. Because as I said, uh, ISIS is today uh, jumping and uh, trying to claim responsibility for every attacks. Little attacks. I don't want to go into details about uh, ISIS and the, its affiliates, brutality and the violence. And the, you can see here in this graph, the casualty rate by terrorist groups in 2019. And then the red ones are ISIS. In, uh, in 2019, ISIS-K was uh, the most little uh, that this group. Also, you can see ISIS West Africa and also other ISIS groups. I think here, I wanna get your attention to New People's Army. In this list, there is only one left-wing revolutionary group operating in, in the Philippines, but the casualty rate, it is just 1.9. So it is, I think uh, uh, the lethality and being deadly or violent is solely incomparably higher for jihadist groups than in other types of terrorism. This is also coming from my another article, Beheadings between 2014 and uh, 2020. I tried to analyze uh, what groups are using this depressing and also uh, terrorist tactic. But you can see here more than 85, 80% 80 of beheadings in the world in this period, in this six year period, happened also under uh, perpetrated by, uh, by, by ISIS, these beheadings. Media and uh, social media, uh, today's world, these groups are more media oriented and they are actively using uh, social media. And uh, I think uh, ISIS was having uh, more than 15,000 Twitter accounts in, in 2014 and 2015. Also ISIS has its own uh, digital magazines like Dabik or news outlets, Amak News Agency uh, or Al Bayan Radio. Also other groups copied ISIS's model. And also we know that today other jihadist groups like Al-Shabaab, they are having uh, their own media out there. Financial resources, uh, ISIS uh, was the wealthiest organization in 2014 and 2015, because the group was generating around $2 billion uh, revenue, $2 billion revenue from oil smuggling, from antiquities uh, trafficking, and also from uh, extortion and others. Also, uh, we know that uh, some ISIS groups and also Al Shabaab or Boko Haram, uh, they are involved in illicit trade or kidnapping or extortion. And these groups are using more again ISIS model to to generate revenue, causing to ignore state terrorism. Of course, in this model, uh, I just wanted to mention about one unintended consequences because uh, because of ISIS course capacity and brutality in 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 Syria. I think Bashar al-Assad began to enjoy the ISIS's presence because in the early years, the European Union and US or Gulf states, they gave their support to Syrian opposition, the moderate groups, just to fight against Bashar al-Assad's uh, atrocities in the country. But what, but, uh, what happened is one unintended consequences in Syria after the emergence of ISIS, I think uh, everyone else in the world, they forgot about Assad and they all, focused on, they all gave their attention uh, ISIS. I think uh, today Assad uh, regime is keeping his position. Maybe they are adapted to uh, ISIS's presence because Russians, Iranians, Turks, and the Gulf states and the, also US, uh, we have seen that these states, they all had some efforts to fight against, uh, against ISIS. So also maybe I can, I can breach a relationship uh, with the presence of ISIS-K because today we know that Taliban is seeking for more legitimacy. I think uh, Taliban is not a legitimate uh, group organization. So we don't believe that Taliban is capable of a ruler uh, in the a legal ruler in the country. But uh, if we see again, uh, more ISIS-K's attacks in Afghanistan, very similarly to Syria, I, I believe, Again, people will be forgetting about Taliban and then Taliban will be enjoying ISIS case presence. So this model has been copied and used by other groups in all over the world. But of course, 
in terms of some unintended consequences, I just I can just uh, talk about it is causing to ignore state terrorism also in the in the conflict zones. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, ISIS models influence. So we have seen more lethal, more deadly groups, more media-oriented groups, the groups more claiming responsibilities, which means that they are more trying to take credit, and also more groups uh, controlling territories and the more inspired individuals uh, from ISIS's ideology, and also more franchises. Of course, we have seen more complicated organizations. I think which is a mes message for in terms of counterterrorism, because uh, we have you know that in Africa, Asia, or in the Middle East, the police or law enforcement are not capable of fighting against these highly complicated organizations. This is my conclusion. Uh, I think it wouldn't be wrong to say that in the world, highly capable terrorist groups, they can develop their own models. And then these models may have impacts on uh, other terrorist groups. And uh, one final word, ISIS may have lost its power in Iraq and Syria, but still keeps its popularity and thanks to its spreading model. Thanks so much for listening to me. So if there are any questions, I can, we can put in QA, uh, QA box here. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting presentation. We see so much in the news about ISIS as spoken very generally as a large group. So this presentation was very helpful to understand um, how complex and international uh, an organization this is. So thank you so very much for sharing your expertise and your time with us. Thanks, Amy. Uh, thanks. We've opened it up to question and answer. Feel free to type your question into the question and answer box if you like. Otherwise, feel free to put it in uh, the chat. We'll wait just a few moments um, for people to you know, get to their questions together. We have a comment, we don't have a question, we just have a uh, appreciation for you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, we actually do have a question. It just came through. Um, would you like to? Would you like me to read it? Um, Please. Okay, thank you. Um, this is uh, Nate Jones from Sam Houston. Great to see you. Have failures on the battlefield in 2017 and reduced ISIS legitima legitimacy and blunted their recruitment capacities in any way or are they still able to recruit at the same levels? I think of course, uh, maybe it's better to look at a uh, regional basis. Maybe uh, ISIS has lost its capacity in, as I told also, as I tried to show you in, in some graphs in Syria and in Iraq. So uh, maybe in, but in Afghanistan, I believe that ISIS now is recruiting more also in Nigeria. So maybe sometimes we should be uh, we should be more case specific. So let me just give one example from Nigeria. I think uh, after the killing of Shekau, also it's another another interesting maybe uh, trend in, in Nigeria. ISIS West Africa was able to target and kill Shekau, the Boko Haram's leader. And Boko Haram's leader was hiding, I think in the last decade in, in the forest area in Nigeria. But then ISIS, ISIS West Africa uh, was able to kill and target uh, Shekau. Now, uh, after the killing of Boko Haram, the Boko Haram's leader, so we have seen some uh, Boko Haram militants joining to, uh, to uh, ISIS West Africa. Uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, this, the, the killing of the leader, or in, uh, as in the case of ISIS-K, because uh, opposition in Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban opposition, maybe they will be more uh, joining to, to ISIS-K. I think uh, how I can answer your question, in Iraq and Syria, uh, the group has lost its capacity because there were around 30,000 militants, but now uh, there are uh, 16,000, of course it is more, but uh, in terms of the recruiting, recruitment of these NIV militants, I think uh, we should look at more 
regional and the more maybe country or case specifics. So ISIS West Africa and ISIS K, I can tell you, they are recruiting more than ISIS core in Syria and uh, in, Syria and in Iraq. Thank you very much. I, uh, we really appreciate that. We have another um, person that just some, that's saying wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. um, I currently don't see any more questions, um, but we do have your um, information available on the website so people can reach out to you with individual or you know private uh, questions as well. We wanna thank you so much for your time and presentation today. It was excellent. Uh, we thank everybody for attending this panel at the International uh, Criminology Journal Conference. So thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you very, very much again for your presentation. Thanks, Emma.